Okay, uh, next up is Bill Bowring. Bill Bowring is a professor of law in the School of Law in Birkbeck, uh, University of London, and he joined the law school in 2006 as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and a practicing barrister at Field Court Chambers at Gray's Inn. Uh, he has previously held posts at the University of East London, University of Essex, and London Metropolitan University, and was director of the Pan European Institute. Uh, University of Essex uh, between 1997 and 2000, Director of the Human Rights and Social Justice Research Institute at London Metropolitan University between 2003 and 2006, and is currently a Fellow of the Human Rights Centre at the University of Essex. Right, none of which is relevant to um, what we talk about now. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, a few words about the Permanent People's Tribunal. And uh, this was an initiative of uh, two organizations in particular, uh, the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, which was founded just after World War II, was very closely involved with national liberation movements uh, for many years. And the other sponsor, uh, I'm a member of the Bureau, was the European Lawyers for Democracy and Human Rights, which is in 21 countries, I happen to be the president of ELDH, and the initiative, the person who really did the work for the Permanent People's Tribunal in Paris was Jan Fermont, a Belgian lawyer, who is the General Secretary of the IADL and on the Bureau of ELDH. And he acted as prosecutor uh, during the hearing, did a huge amount of the drafting, and he's been taking the extraordinary cases in the uh, Brussels courts on the question whether the PKK is a terrorist organization, uh, etc. So, a really great initiative by Jan, I would say, in particular, and we were very proud to be uh, supporting it. And um, just to come on to the question of uh, what I was doing personally, uh, I was the <coughs> first expert witness, or indeed the first witness during the uh, Permanent People's Tribunal. I should say, Permanent People's Tribunal and the International Association of Democratic Lawyers go all the way back. It's many of the same people, uh, very, very closely linked. And the Lilo Basso Foundation it is very much interlinked with uh, IDL, so it's, that was particularly good. So, what was I asked to talk about in the uh, as the first witness? And it was the right I stress not principle, it's a right in international law of people's to self-determination. And it is uh, frequently forgotten for reasons which will be immediately apparent that this was the initiative of Vladimir Lenin, uh, the leader of the Russian Revolution, um, and something about which he was writing several books on the right of nations to self-determination uh, prior to the First World War. Uh, the first initiatives on his part after the, for, after the Russian Revolution were indeed self-determination and independence uh, for a number of uh, former uh, parts of the Russian Empire, and he was for breaking up of all the great empires and colonial empires in particular. <coughs> By the way, the person who regards Lenin as anathema these days is Vladimir Putin, uh, who regards Lenin as having been personally responsible for the end of the great Russian Empire, well he was, that's a fact, uh, but also as having been personally responsible for the collapse of the Soviet Union, which Putin regards as the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. So Lenin is the vi villain who was responsible for all of this. And why this is highly relevant to what we're talking about today is that the major events of international law after the Second World War were the decolonization, national liberation struggles. And you will not find the right of peoples to self-determination in the UN Charter. That's because it was dominated then by the colonial powers. And it was only during the 1950s, uh, 1960 onwards, that you had a whole number of former colonial territories joining the United Nations and States. Uh, declaration was passed in 1960 in the General Assembly with all of the colonial powers abstaining on the question of the right to self-determination of peoples. 1976 was the crucial date for the Permanent People's Tribunal because that was the Algiers Declaration 
not part of the United Nations, but that was where the uh, national liberation movements came together on the rights of peoples, and that's why it is the permanent people's uh, tribunal. So self-determination only became a right in international law uh, with the covenants on human rights of the United Nations, two covenants on civil and political rights and on economic, cultural and social rights of 1966. They came to force in 1976, the same year as the Algiers Declaration. So from 1976 onwards, you can say it is an absolute right in international law, and it is said to be, sorry, two Latin words, a right ergo omnes. That means that all states have a duty and an interest in seeing that it is uh, protected. Now, what's relevant to the Kurds? It doesn't mean that the Kurds are entitled to their own independent state now. However, they are a people, they have a right to uh, self-determination, and the form that that takes is, and you'll see this in the judgment, uh, autonomy within Turkey, and at the very least, the preservation of their cultural identity and of their political rights. And what we saw for a few years, a few years back, was the beginning of the recognition of the existence of the Kurds in Turkey, of the existence of their language, uh, that happened even under Erdogan. However, since the failed coup in 2016, as we see, there's an all-out attack, not only on the Kurds physically, um, in Chisre, uh, in Afrin, and so on, but on the cultural linguistic rights of the Kurds. That is the very existence of the Kurds as a people. And that's why that is the first section of the judgment of the Permanent People's Tribunal, that actually what has been happening uh, in particularly the last couple of years is the attempt to extinguish the Kurdish people in violation of their right in the international law, which is the right to self-determination. So if that you will find in the judgment, it's the first section. Uh, it was a great honor to be invited to be the first witness to address that uh, topic. Um, is this binding on anybody? No, it's not. I'm afraid to say Mr. Erdogan, for the time being, will walk free. This is all about, though, educating the communities, the mass movements, the public as to what is going on, and also showing that in international law, uh, there are very clear rules which are being violated and which we should seek to um, protect. Thank you very much for your attention.